أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إذا السماء فطرت وإذا الكواكب انتثرت وإذا البحار فجرت وإذا القبور برفرت علمت نفس ما قدمت وأخرت يا أيها الإنسان ما غبك بربك الكريم الذي خلقك فسواك فعدلك في أي سورة ما شاء ركبك كلا بل تكذبون بالدين وإن عليكم لحافظين كراما كاتبين يعلمون ما تفعلون إن الأبرار لفي نعيم وإن الفجار لفي جحيم يصلونها يوم الدين وما هم عنها بغائبين وما أدراك ما يوم الدين ثم ما أدراك ما يوم الدين يوم لا تملك نفس لنفس شيئا والأمر يومئذ لله إن شاء الله we continue from Surah Abasa we are now on the 30th juz we are now at the very end of the Quran um, although we are at the very end but we still have a lot of surahs left so because these surahs are very small, I'm going to just basically go over the name, translate it, and maybe I mention one or two points. I'm going to try to force myself not to go into an explanation, because if we do that, we'll never finish. It will take till next year to finish it, since we have still over 30 surahs left. So <clears throat> surah number 80 is surah Abasa. Abasa means he frowned. And this is a reference to the incident of the Prophet and Abdullah bin Umi Maktoum radiallahu anhu, the blind sahabi, who was also the mu'addin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Once he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he wanted to learn from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he frowned and he turned away from him because at that point, he was speaking to some of the leaders of the Quraysh. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was hoping that if they accept Islam, since these are the leaders, the chieftains, that everyone else would follow so that's why the Prophet was putting so much emphasis on trying to convert the leaders, right? So the Prophet he had no like personal agenda or he was not trying to get some personal benefit by giving more emphasis to the leaders. He was for the sake of Islam and it makes perfect sense. But because these people are so arrogant, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gently rebuked the Prophet that if they don't want to accept, don't worry about them. Rather, this person who's eager to learn from you, you should give him full attention. You shouldn't frown and turn away from him. So the Prophet is gently reprimanded in the surah. And once again, this shows that this Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? This is one of the proofs that can be used against those who say that Na'udhu Billah, the Prophet plagiarized, he authored this book himself. Because any author, when they write a book, they want to say all of the praise, right, for themselves. No one wants to write something in their book in which they will be criticized. Yet, in some of these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gently rebukes her Prophet And Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she used to say, if there were any verses that our Prophet would have hidden, it would have, it would have been these type of verses. This one from Surah Hazab, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is gently you know, criticizing or reprimanding our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But the Prophet sallallahu is a Rasul, he's the messenger, he's conveying everything that is revealed to him. So this surah was also revealed, okay? So this is the sabab al nuzul of Surah Abasa. The next surah is Surah uh, Takwir. Uh, so surah number 81, 82, and 84, they are very similar. So far we're saying twin surahs, these surahs are triplets. They're all kind of the same. In fact, in one hadith, the Prophet said, Whoever wants to see Yawm al Qiyamah as if it is happening right before his eyes, if you want a very clear and vivid description, a picture of Qiyamah, just read the, these three short surahs. The day when the sun would be folded up and it would lose its light. When all of the stars would fall. 
the entire solar system would collapse, the universe would collapse. So this surah basically uh, describes the seed for us. Surah Taqweel, Taqweel literally means the folding up. Infitar, okay, which means to split open, right? The cleaving asunder. And al inshiqaq okay? It has a similar meaning. They're synonyms. Infitar and inshiqaq to split open, to burst open. Uh, <clears throat> surah 83 is Surah Mutaffifin. Tatfif or Mutaffifin are those who default in their duty, in their responsibility. Woe to those who default in their duty. What does this mean? Those that when they take measurement from people, they take the full measurement. When they give measure or they weigh for others and they give to others, then they default or they give less than what is due. Now, this is used in the context of business, right? That when you want someone to pay you, you want him to pay you the full amount. But then when you're working for someone, you're being negligent. You're not doing what is required of you. So although it is said in the context of business, but our scholars mention that this can be used in a very generic sense, right? For example, when it comes to being on time, right? If you are the boss of a company, you expect all of your employees to be on time. When it comes to you serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you come on time for salah, right? You should not have two standards. Even when it comes to dealing with human beings, right? That when it comes to, um, you know, <clears throat> others, you might criticize others that they don't do things on time. They don't do, but when it comes to your time, when you organize an event, you start on time or does the Imam have to wait for two, three hours when he's invited to a nikah? He has to wait for two, three hours. Yet you're the same person criticizing everyone else and the whole ummah of how things are not done in an organized manner, how everyone else, they do things, you know, you know, in a manner that is not Islamic. But when it comes to you, you're like, no, no, it's okay. You know, this is once in a, once in a lifetime uh, event. Why make a big deal out of it? So you cannot have double standards, right? Uh, so this can be applied at so many different levels. Uh, next surah is surah Buruj. Al-Buruj is surah number 85. This surah has 22 verses. It was revealed in Mecca. Buruj means the constellations, the stars. Right. This is another amazing, miraculous sign in nature. Unfortunately, we're living in the city. We're deprived of this. But if you go into the wilderness or away from the city, and you look up you'll be amazed, right, at how beautiful the sky is, that literally you have billions on billions of stars in the sky. And some of these stars are bigger than our planet, right? And there's so many galaxies that they haven't discovered yet. So Allah takes an oath by the sky full of these constellations, right? And it also references the story of the people of the ditch, right? There were people that were persecuted, and there was a tyrant king who had dug trenches in the city and he had basically thrown all of the believers into that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qutil ashab al Woe to the people of the trenches. The fire that was lit to a blaze. When they were sitting by it, and they were witnessing what they were doing to the believers. Okay, So these were believers who were persecuted physically, they were tortured, and they were thrown into uh, these pits of fire, these trenches that were dug throughout the city. The famous story uh, of the woman who was brought to the trench and then her baby spoke from the cradle, that is basically uh, related to this incident. Okay, awesome said, there were three infants or three babies that spoke miraculously from the cradle. One of them was in the story of the trench. The other one was in the story of Sahib al the story of George. And the third one is Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. He spoke from the cradle. The next surah is Surah Al-Tariq. Al-Tariq means the comer by night. And it is a reference to the stars that appear at night. So once again, the stars, it is also an amazing sign in creation, right? Some of these stars are even bigger than our sun. And how big is our sun? 
it is said 1.3 million Earth could fit inside of the sun. And some of these stars are even bigger than the sun. The next surah is Surah Al-A'la. Surah Al-A'la and Surah Ghashia are also like twin surahs because they are generally recited together. The Prophet would recite them on Friday, sometimes on Eid as well. Al-A'la means the Most High. This is one of the names of Allah. Sabbih isma rabbik al-A'la. Glorifying the name of your Lord, Al-A'la, who is the Most High. When this was revealed, Prophet ﷺ, he said to the Sahaba, place this in your sujood. So that's why in Sajda, we say, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la. Praise and glory be to Allah, the Most High. When you are in the lowest position in Salah, when you have humbled yourself before Allah, you call upon the highest. Why? Because it is the rule of Allah that the one who humbles himself before him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevates his status. So when you are in the lowest position, you call upon the highest. The next surah is surah Ghashia. al Ghashia means the overwhelming event. This is another descriptive name of Qiyamah. Qiyamah has many names. Qiyamah, the standing. People will be standing. Yawm al-Hasra, the day of regret. Yawm al right? The manifestation of losses. Yawm al-Hisab, the day of reckoning. Another one is Ghashia, Waqia, the event. Ghashia, the overwhelming event. And basically it talks about the two groups of people, right? The believers and the disbelievers. And then it talks about the blessings that they will have in Jannah. Uh, next surah is Surah Al-Fajr. It is surah number 89. It has 30 verses. It was revealed in Makkah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath by the dawn. Wal-Fajr. Walayalin Ash. And in this, there is also a very profound meaning as well. That the one who can bring physical light after physical darkness can also bring light after hardship. Can also bring ease after hardship. Okay? And this is something we witness every day. The one who is capable of doing this, of bringing light after such darkness, can also bring ease after hardship as well. There are few surahs in the Quran that are named after Salah. Right? And this is just so that you can remember these surahs. You have Fajr, you have Asr, you have Jum'ah, and you have Duha. These are also names of prayers. The next surah is Surah Al-Balad. Al-Balad is a reference to Makkah. لا أقسم بهذا البلد I swear by the city So Allah takes an oath by Makkah Now this shows the blessings of Makkah Makkah is a very blessed city When the Prophet ﷺ had to migrate from Makkah right, During his migration When he was leaving And he looked at Makkah With tears in his eyes He looked at Makkah And he said You are the most beloved city to me If your people had not driven me out I would have not left you Right? Um, and so our scholars, they mention that the most sacred cities in the world are Mecca and then Medina. These are the two most sacred cities. Right? And I actually had given a lecture on the uh, blessings, the unique blessings of Mecca. There's actually two lectures. The first one is the 20 unique blessings of Mecca, and then the other one, the 20 unique blessings of Medina. Now, of course, this is not mentioned in Hadith, but I just looked at different Hadith and verses and tried to make a list of 20 unique things. So for example, one unique thing about Mecca is that Allah has taken an oath by it. You don't have no other city in the world, no matter how great of a city, you know, that we you hear all these names, but it's nothing compared to Mecca. Allah has taken an oath by it. Number two, anything you do over there, it is multiplied by a hundred thousand times. That's another unique thing. A third unique thing, it is a haram. It's a sacred place. You cannot hunt animals. Everything is sacred, safe, and secure. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, there's so many other things as well. So this is Surah Al-Balad. Uh, the next Surah is Surah Al-Shams. Surah Al-Shams and Surah Al-Layl are also kind of sort of like twin Surahs. They're very similar in style and in structure. Uh, they begin with uh, oaths. Surah Al-Shams begins with many oaths, right? And this is the only Surah that has the most amount of oaths. Allah takes an oath, one after another, right? So this shows that the message given here must be very important. Just like when we want to emphasize something, right? If it's very important, right? We say, Wallahi, right? I swear by Allah. 
And we should do this rarely, not all the time with every single statement, right? When something is very important. Imagine when Allah takes an oath, and then imagine when He takes several oaths, by the sun and her brightness, by the moon when it follows her, by the day that reveals her, by the night that covers her, by the sky, the one who constructed it, the earth and the one who spread it, and by the soul and the one who perfected it, and then reveal to it the good and the bad. Right? So Allah takes all of these oaths and different things, and then He says, What? What is the subject of the oath? What are these oaths being taken upon? Very simple. Indeed, successful is the one who purifies his soul. Okay, let's get to the uh, And then there is a reference to the story of Thamud. The next surah is Surah Al Layl. Al Layl means the night. And this surah also begins with oaths. By the night that covers. By the day that reveals. And by uh, what he has created of the male and the female. So everything is in dual form. You have the day, you have the night, you have the male, you have the female. All of your efforts are also diverse. Every person is working in a different way, a unique way. Everyone is, of course, working hard. But all of these efforts can primarily be divided into two categories. Either the effort that will lead him to Jannah, or the effort that might eventually lead him to Jahannam. The one who gives charity, fears Allah, believes in al husna the best, who make the path to Jannah easy for him. So this is one effort. All of the effort in the world that people do, it is basically, it can be categorized into one of these two categories. And the other one, the one who is bakhila, who is miserly, who is stingy, wastagna, and considers himself self-sufficient, rejects the best, who make the path to Jahannam easy for him. The next surah is Surah Al-Duha. Surah Al-Duha and Surah Al-Nashrah, they are also twin surahs. They are also very similar. Surah Al-Duha was one of the first surah that was revealed after Fatrat al-Wahi. What is Fatrat al-Wahi? The pause in revelation. The Prophet ﷺ, he received uh, his first wahi in the cave of Hira, right? And that was the beginning verses of Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khara. And then after that, there was a pause in revelation. So the Prophet initially received some revelation, and then there was a pause. How long was this? Some scholars mentioned a few weeks. Some even say more than that. Right? Some even say up to three years. But anyways, what seems to be the stronger opinion is that it was for about a few weeks. There was a pause in revelation. So it grieved the Prophet now. Like what has happened? right? And so Allah revealed the surah by the uh, brightness of the day. And by the night. Your Lord has neither forsaken you nor is he displeased with you. And some of the Quraysh started taunting the Prophet that what has happened as some even referred to Jibreel as shaitan, but has your shaitan left you? So it grieved the Prophet even more. Then he was even more worried that is it something that he may have done? So Allah revealed the surah to console and comfort the Prophet. Um, by the way, I gave a whole lecture on this, right? Um, how to cure depression through the psychology of Surah Al-Duha, right? So it's a very beautiful surah. Uh, maybe sometimes I may give a lecture on it so you understand this more in detail. But just know for now that Surah Al-Duha talks about three uh, worldly blessings on the Prophet and Surah Inshirah talks about three spiritual blessings on the Prophet What are the three physical worldly blessings, right? That were bestowed upon the Prophet They are referenced from uh, they are mentioned uh, from verse number 6 to verse number 10. Alam yajidka yatiman fa'awa. Did he not find you an orphan and then gave you protection? Okay. Prophet he was orphaned twice. He lost his father and mother, right, at a young age. 
ووجدك ضالا فغى he found you unaware and then guided you and ووجدك عائلا فغى he found you to be poor and then he enriched you right he made you wealthy that is through the marriage right with Khadija رضي so now three things are mentioned فأما اليتيم فلا تقل as for the orphan do not repulse him because once upon a time you were an orphan and Allah gave you protection so فأما اليتيم فلا تقل and this shows that we should also take care of an orphan like make it a point or a goal in your life that you know you should try to sponsor an orphan right it doesn't really cost much especially back home you have all these organizations to sponsor an orphan because there's so many hadith that we just seems to kind of hear these hadith and think that these are hadith are just for other people right just like when we make the announcement you know after taraweeh that the brothers who are sitting in the third row to come please fill up the lines right in the second each one thinks that the announcement is for someone else and everyone is still sitting and everyone just smiling looking around why are people listening so the same thing when we hear these hadith about kafir yatim it's not for some stranger else it's for me and you the Prophet said that I and the guardian of the orphan will be like this on Yom Qiyamah, on the Day of Judgment, right? So we should take care of uh, at least one orphan. If you can do more, that is even better. What was the first blessing? He found you an orphan and gave you protection. The second one is he found you wandering, looking for the truth, right? And then he was giving wahi and revelation, right? We don't translate this as dalad, as uh, misguided. That would not be appropriate. The Prophet was never misguided in the sense, now the Billah, that he worshipped an idol. But of course, before revelation, right, he didn't have the knowledge that he was given after revelation. Through wahi, then he was giving the details of the sharia. So he's curious, he's wondering, right, and then Allah sends revelation upon him. So what is the next one? Wa sa'il, the one who is inquisitive, who is asking, don't push him away. If they want to have a question, you should try to answer. The third one, found you to be poor and then he enriched you. So now what should you do? You should be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for the blessings of your Lord, do proclaim. Mention the blessings of Allah upon you. Now what does this mean? I mean, we don't go to the other extreme either. If you start showing off, if you have a nice car, you got a new job, you start telling everyone, start showing off. That's also not allowed. For two reasons, showing off is haram. Number two, when you start telling everyone, then you can also be affected by the evil way. So then how do we understand that with this? The way we understand this is that we shouldn't be complaining about everything. Instead of just complaining about the things we don't have, you can mention the generic blessings that Allah has given you. Right? Alhamdulillah, I have health, you know, I have children, I can eat three times a day, I have a roof over my head, right? You don't have to mention the unique blessings that you have been given to people that might become jealous of you. Okay? So that's how we reconcile between the two. That if Allah has, I don't know, promoted you to maybe, you know, I don't know, you got a better job and by you mentioning that, if some people might become jealous of you, right? Then okay, maybe you don't mention that. But generic blessings, you can mention them. Okay, that is the meaning of the ayah. And the next surah is surah to inshirah. In it, Allah mentions three spiritual blessings. Okay, Sharh al-Sadr, the opening of the chest, وَوَضَعَنَا عَنْ كَوِزْرَ The uh, <clears throat> removing of the burden. And number three, رَفْعِ الذِّكْرِ Raising his status. So what is Sharh al-Sadr? Right? To open up your chest, to make things easy for you. Right? Uh, to open your heart to something. This is not to be taken in a literal sense. Right? Sharh al-Sadr. That's a different incident. We also believe that happened to the Prophet's chest was physically open, right? But that's Sharh Sadr. This is Sharh Sadr. Sharh Sadr is when you're confident, okay? And you are at ease with something. And you're, you know, even in English, we use this term as well. But now my heart is open to this, right? And this is similar to the dua of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, when he said, Rabbi shrahli sadri. Oh Allah, open up my heart, my chest. Not like in a physical sense, but spiritually. Okay. The second is what a wizard, right? To remove the burden from you. Okay. And what is that burden? Again, that requires some explanation. The third one is Rafa al the raising of his status. Okay. And I spoke about this before. 
But the name Muhammad is a name that is used more than any other name. Look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made Al-Qasr famous throughout the world and throughout history. There is no historical figure that is more well known than our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? Throughout the world, his name is mentioned literally hundreds of thousands of times on a daily basis. Right? Whenever you have someone giving the adhan, saying, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, the next, next thing he said, Ashadu anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah. And this happens continuously because the sun is rising and also setting at the same time. In fact, we can say, Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, all of these salahs and the adhan for all of these salahs are happening continuously, non-stop, at the same time. Why? Because the world is round. So when Fajr is happening in one place, Dhuhr and Asr and Maghrib and Isha, all of these salahs and the adhan for all of these salahs are also taking place at the exact same time. So you have throughout the world, this is being echoed throughout the four corners of the globe. Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. So if this is not Raf'i Dhikr, what is Raf'i Dhikr? So these are the three spiritual blessings mentioned here. Uh, the next surah is Surah At-Teen. at means the fig. And Allah takes an oath by the fig, the olive. And this must show that, subhanAllah, it must have a lot of benefits. And now we know as well, uh, about Zaytun, olive, that it has a lot of benefits. But I'm thinking the fact that Deen is also mentioned, it must also have a lot of uh, health benefits as well that we may have not discovered yet, right? But of course, everything has to be eaten in moderation. So I spoke about this as well. I gave a lecture before about staying healthy. So when we read these hadith and all of these verses, don't just you know start you know buying Deen and Zaytun and just Meaning that in moderation, anything that is, uh, you know, <clears throat> that grows from the ground and you eat it in moderation is always good for you, right? Uh, especially when it comes to Zaytun, I think we don't need to give any explanation, right? We all know the benefits, the medical benefits, the health benefits of Zayt, Zaytun, the olive oil, the olives, and what the fig, even though it's no one talks about it that much, it's just my belief that if Allah has mentioned it next to a teen, it must also have some interesting and unique uh, benefits as well. But Tini was Zaytun, Waturi Sinin, Wahad al Balad al Amin. By the fig and the olive, by Mount Sinai, and by this sacred city. So Allah takes an oath by three things or four things, and each one is a reference to a certain location which a prophet was sent. It's a reference to basically the three Abrahamic faiths. Right? It is a reference to what Tini was Zaytun, Isa alayhi salatu Zaytun in Jerusalem. Even to this day, the, the olives that are known are the olives of Jerusalem. Turi Sinin, Mount Sinai. This is Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. Right? And the third one, Wahad al Balad al Amin. And this city that is safe and secure, which is Mecca. So Allah is taken oath by these three regions to which three great prophets were sent. The next surah is Surah Alam. It is the 96th chapter of the Quran. It's a Makki surah. It has 19 verses. And it is the last surah that has an ayah of sajda at the very end. Uh, the first five verses was literally the first revelation that the Prophet received in the cave of Hira. When he went to the cave of Hira, he would go and he would, you know, stay there for some time. Um, before revelation began, the Prophet ﷺ, he started to, you know, kind of go away from the city of Mecca and just, you know, go and, I don't like using the word meditating, but meaning he'll go there and just, you know, worship and think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and worship it in a manner that, you know, we don't have any details of. A certain way. He, and then he did this for about six months. And then Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, he appeared before him one day and said, Iqra, read. Awesome said, Ma ana biqari. I don't know how to read. And Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, hugged him, squeezed him so hard that the Prophet said, I felt that I had lost all of the energy that I had. And then he said again, Iqra, read, recite. Awesome said, I don't know how to read. And again, the same thing happened. I'm sure all of you know the whole story. And the Prophet he came rushing down the mountain and he went to the house of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. Because he didn't know what had happened, right? He didn't know what this was. And these were the first verses that were revealed. 
Read in the name of your Lord who created خلق الإنسان من علق who created man from a clot of blood. اقرأ وربك الأكرم. Read and your Lord is most bountiful. الذي علم بالقلم who has taught by the pen. علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم. He has taught man that which he did not know. And we spoke about the qalam, the pen, and how this is a unique blessing giving to mankind. I spoke about that, about the surah, when we were speaking uh, in the tafsir of surah qalam. The next surah is surah qadr. Qadr means, right, predestination. Qadr also means something of value, right? When you have, uh, when something is very precious, when you have value for something, we even use this word in other languages as well. Those of you who know Udu, you know, you say you have qadr for someone. So it's a night of qadr, it's a night of value because the reward is multiplied, multifold. Anyone who worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very valuable in the sight of Allah. Also, it is the night of predestination because whatever is to happen in the upcoming year, all of that is given to the angels. And I gave a tafsir of this and in Ramadan, I'm sure we've heard you know many, many explanations of the surah, surah al-qadr. Next surah is surah al-bayyana. It is surah number 98. This is <clears throat> one of the few surahs that is actually Madani. All of the other surahs are Makki because it talks about the people of the book, the Jews and Christians. And the Jews and Christians, they were in Medina, right? Uh, especially the Jews and even the Christians as well because uh, Christians were in Najran. They were not really in Makka. So any surah that talks about the hypocrites or it talks about the Jews and Christians or it talks about laws, and generally, that surah will be a Madani surah. Uh, it talks about Bayyana. Bayyana means the clear proof. Okay? Those who disbelieve the people of the book and the polities, they will not desist from the kufr until a clear proof comes to them. What is that clear proof? Rasul min Allah, messenger from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next surah is Surah Zilzal. Zilzal uh, means the earthquake, Zalzala. This is a reference to the final earthquake, okay? the final earthquake of the Day of Judgment. When the earth would be shaken up with the utmost shake, and the earth would throw out her burdens, man would say, what has happened to her? Now this, is, this can be a reference to the actual Day of Judgment, or right before the Day of Judgment. Because the Paul Samson, even before the Day of Judgment, we have the minor signs and major signs. The minor signs would be that there will be a lot of earthquakes. That's the minor sign. Again, it's a change in a... As I said, the minor signs are not one-off events, right? These are things that will start happening. And then the major signs are just one-off events. So even within the major signs, the 10 major signs, we have the three major earthquakes. So these are three major earthquakes that would happen. Then you have the actual day of judgment, right? So this could be understood in both ways, either the actual day of judgment or right before the day of judgment when the earthquakes would happen. So the earth would throw out her burdens. If we, if this is a reference to the actual qiyamah, the day of judgment, then this will be a reference to uh, human beings who are buried in the ground and the earth will throw them out, people will be resurrected. They will come back to life, right? And if we were to understand this just before Qiyamah, then this is a reference to all of the gold and silver and the wealth, right? That are basically buried underneath the ground, that the earth will throw this these out. Because there's a hadith, some interesting hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said that before Qiyamah, the earth will throw out columns of gold and silver, and then you have all of this, and people would say, it is because of this that I fought, because of this. But at that point, you know, it will be of no use. So anyways, this could be understood in both ways. Zalzara means the earthquake, either the actual day of judgment or right before it. Uh, it's 7.02, so we'll stop here. Uh, we just have a few surahs left, so hopefully tomorrow we'll finish. And then we have the activity, inshallah, and we'll have the game based on everything we have done. See that we have done. If you want to participate, if not, you can just listen and watch. But I will be giving cash prizes to the participants. So tomorrow it will be to the top 10 uh, people. Just it will be like a like a trial, like a test. 
found us to see how we do. So you're just gonna be for the top 10 participants, just you know, ten dollars, just to see if everyone understands how it works. And then inshallah on Thursday, we will have the main one. That will be to the top three. So the first person will get sixty dollars. The second one fifty. The third one forty dollars. It's just simple question based on everything we have covered, right? All of the tafsir that we have done so far. Just review all of the notes and everything, and it will be based on that, inshallah. Okay. Let me now <clears throat> hand it over to Mufti Zaid. Uh, inshallah, he will conclude. It's up to him now if he wants to. Conclude today, or if he has more du'as, if he wants to do, uh, if he has more du'as, he can do them tomorrow. It's a day. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa sallam ala Rasulullah Kareem. Inshallah, we will conclude today. I'm just going to go through some of the last few du'as uh, that we have. Um, obviously, there are many other du'as also that are mentioned in the Quran, but just some of the few important ones, inshallah, we'll just go through them. Um, the next one over here is Dua number 28, which is in Surah Bani Israel, verse number 80. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's a very famous ruku we hear it many a times, read in Salah as well. Aqim as-salatu li dhuluk as-shams ila ghasat al-layli wa Qur'an al-fajr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention the command to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had when the command was given to migrate from Makkah Mukarramah to Madinah Munawwara, at that time this was the dua of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rabbi adkhilni mudkhala sidq wa akhrijni mukhraj sidq wa ja'alni min ladunka sultan al-nasira. And the translation is, Oh my Lord, grant me an honorable entrance and an honorable exit and give me a supporting authority from yourself. So this was the dua of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he was commanded with hijrah. And the ulama, they also say that when a person, he enters into a new city, an area that he hasn't been before, then what this is a dua that he should recite. Or any other city that he's entering, this is a dua for a person to recite. The next dua number 29. Um, this is the dua of the Musa alayhi salam. As we know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Taha explains how Musa alayhi salam was given uh Nubuwa prophethood, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, at that time, while he was by the tree, Allah had commanded him, given him wahi innani on Allah, wa la ilaha illa na fa'abudni. At that time, what were some of the du'as of Hadith Musa alayhi salam? They were, Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Oh my Lord, uplift my heart for me and make my task easy and remove the impediment from my tongue so people may understand my speech. So if you look at this, this basically divides into three different types of three du'as over here. Number one, ishrah li sadri. Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you open, you expand my heart so that number one, the wahi, the knowledge that I'm supposed to receive, oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I can receive that. Sorry. Number two, wa yassir li amri. Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my matters, because remember, he was to be given the task of going to speak to Fir'aun. And Fir'aun was a tyrant. So Allah, wa yassir li amri, make this task easy for me. وَحْلُلْ عُقُدَةً مِّلْ لِسَانِي And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remove the impediment from my tongue. As we have heard before, that Musa alayhi salam, he had a type of a luqnat. He had um, a stutter in his tongue. There are different reasons um, why the Mufassirin, they have written why he had this. Um, no time to go into the details of that. But Musa alayhi salam made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That of Allah, this luqnat and this uh, stutter that I have, oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remove this from my tongue. Why? So that the people, they may understand my speech. So the ulama, they write when a person, he is going to address a crowd or he is going to explain someone to something to someone. This is a dua that a person he should recite. And even general, right? whenever a person wants to make any type of decision, this is a dua that a person should recite. Oh Allah, open my heart towards that which is good and correct and make my matters easy for me. The next dua, number 30, also famous dua, um, Surah Taha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقُرْ رَبِّ زِدْنِ عِلْمَ And oh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa say, that about, oh my Lord, increase me in knowledge. So this is a dua for the increasing of knowledge and this is a very, very comprehensive dua. A dua we should always recite as it is necessary for us to increase our knowledge, especially from the spiritual aspect and the concept of deen, that what we must always increase our ilm and our knowledge. And um, dua number 31, this is the dua of some of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا وَلِإِخْوَانِنَا الَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَا بِالْإِيمَانِ وَلَا تَجْعَلْ فِي قُلُوبِنَا غِلَّا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا رَبَّنَا إِنَّكَ رَؤُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ O oh, our Lord, forgive us and our fellow believers who preceded us in faith, and do not allow bitterness in, into our hearts towards those who believe. 
O oh, our Lord, indeed, you are ever most gracious and you are the most merciful. So number one, the Mufassirin, they write that this is the type of dua which reflects the attitude of a mu'min. That what he has not only concern for himself, but he has concern for his other friends as other believers as well, the mu'mineen. And this shows us the type of love that a person should have for his fellow beings, especially his community, those that are around him, his Muslim brothers and sisters, and protection from having enmity and, be, and uh, envious action towards his fellow mu'mineen and his muslimin. So over here, number one is the dua for forgiveness for those that have preceded us in faith. Some of the, some of the Mufassirin they have written this was regarding those that had already brought iman before the hijrah and those that will bring iman afterwards and the second one is that Allah remove any type of ghil ghil is any type of ill feeling any type of bitterness hatred enmity oh Allah remove all that from our hearts why Rabbana innaka ra'ufur rahim oh Allah you are the one that is ever gracious the one that is very very kind and rahim the one that is the most merciful and the last dua we will conclude with is dua number um, 31. Rabbana atmim lana nurana wa gfir lana innaka ala kulli shayin qadir. This is dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. O oh, our Lord, perfect us, perfect for us our light and forgive us. Indeed, you are over all things competent. Meaning what this is something that would be make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. O oh, Allah, the nur that you have granted us, the nur of iman, the nur of hidayah. O oh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, complete it. Perfect this for us. O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, forgive us. Why you are that being that is capable. You have put with over every single thing. And with this we conclude our Quranic supplication and du'as as well. We make du'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to complete our nur. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive each and every single one of us in this auspicious month of Ramadan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of our ibadat. I would like to thank Mufti Izhar for all of the efforts that Mufti Sabi has put in all of the tafsir. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept his efforts. May Allah accept this concern and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of those as well that I had have been coming and listening every single day. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this a means of hidayah and guidance for each and every single one of us. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. Subhanallah wa bihamdik. Subhanallah wa bihamdik. Nashadu la ilaha illa anta. I would like to thank Mufti Zayi and also Mufti Bilal as well because they also did a lot of work behind the scenes. Many of you did not see. Even just making the slides and things like that requires time, especially for a hafid, an imam. You know, they have to lead the salah, have to prepare for tarawih, they have to do their own tafsir and things like that. And still, they're taking out time from their busy schedule to, you know, uh, share some of this with us. I'd like to thank them as well. Uh, those of you who would like to get the list of all of these du'as, text me because I actually have all of these du'as, like in a book format. Uh, I can send it. For some reason, I couldn't send it to all of the WhatsApp groups, right? But if anyone needs it, uh, I can send it to individuals. So we have these Quranic du'as, and uh, there's actually a series of, uh, there's different series we have completed so far. I don't know if you realize, we did a series on du'as, right? About 31 du'as. We have the month of Ramadan, which has about 29 or 30 days. So we have completed about 30, 31 du'as. We did the parables of the Quran, right? Um, more than 30 parables. We did close to 40 parables. Then we did the tafsir of the 30 Jews of the Quran, right? So that was the third one. Uh, and so if anyone needs uh, the Quranic dua, just text me and then I'll send it to you um, individually. For some reason, I cannot send it to all of the group chats. We send it to one chat for one individual at a time. So I, that's why I didn't send it. Uh, I did send it to few, but not all of the group chats. And maybe tomorrow I might send uh, the parables as well. And there's a book on that as well. So if you're interested, if anyone is interested, I can send that book as well. And of course, the book would explain the parables in a lot more detail. So with this, we conclude. Tomorrow, we still have the tafsir left. And then we'll also have the kahoot game based on the tafsir that we have covered. It's going to be a fun activity. I would like all of the parents to join with their kids. Uh, if you don't want to put your name, you can just put your child's name so in case you know they don't get a very high score. You can just blame it on them. Uh, or you can put someone else's name, right? No one would know. But if you win, just text me and uh, inshallah we'll send you the, the cash prize. Anyone can join. You don't have to be at the masjid. You can join from anywhere. So tomorrow will be more like a trial test, right? We want to see how it goes. Uh, that's why the cash prize is only $10 in case you put a join or you join late. But try your best to join on time and make sure your connection is good, your phone connection or your laptop connection. Because if you're getting the question right and there's a delay in the, the, the question that you receive, then your score is going to be 
lower than everyone else because they test you in accuracy and also your speed. So if you don't uh, click quickly or you might uh, click on the answer quickly, but if it takes some time and your connection is not strong, that can affect your score actually. And then Thursday, inshallah, uh, we will have the, uh, the main uh, Kahoot game. So I want everyone to join tomorrow at 6.30. First 15, 20 minutes, I'll try to finish off the surahs and then we'll have the, the game, inshallah. It will be very fun. And I think the parents, uh, they will enjoy it as well. Uh, they can also help their children. They want to help them, you know, so cheating is allowed. You can actually even have the list. You can look at it, right? Uh, but uh, the thing is you would have to study because cheating is not going to help you because by the time you try to look for the answer, uh, you're going to run out of time. So it's based on speed quickly. Okay, you might have different questions. For example, if I said, which is the surah that talks about the story of the cow? Yeah, Baqarah. So if I were to give you four options, Fatiha, Surah Nas, Surah Talakha, Surah Ikhlas, you should know it's Baqarah. Okay, that's an easy question. Now, of course, all of them are not going to be like that. All right, shall I see everyone tomorrow, 6.30. Thank you very much.